um, I guess we could start so that we could, uh, yeah. So good afternoon, um, everyone, and welcome to ETC Group's one in a series of webinars on digitalization, corporate power, and the future of food in um, Asia Pacific. I'm Ditit Pellegrina from Greenpeace Southeast Asia, and on holidays or spare times, <laughs> uh, I also sit as uh, part of the board of ETC Group, I think for more than 10 years, no ne? So yeah, that's my identity. And I'll be your moderator uh, for this afternoon session. So um, yeah, it's really nice to see everyone and have some sort of a mini reunion. So and I'm excited to hear more from all of you, um, especially this afternoon no, as we explore our topic uh, for this afternoon. The COVID-19 era ushered in and fast track um, digitalization in food and agriculture, almost in all aspects of our lives. Um, just the other day, I was with the Asian Farmers Association's uh, regional meeting on family farms. And there were actually conversations around how digital technology supported farmers' cooperatives um, to access new markets and shorten the supply chain with the collapse of the traditional market and delivery system um, during the lockdown. Almost all of us, I think you'll have to admit, <laughs> um, with our online purchases, our social media posts, our digital campaigns no, and um, engagements are slowly being ruled one way or the other by algorithms. Algocracy is transforming our world. Now we have policies designed by data scientists. So we hear of data-driven um, policies, even data-driven campaigns. <laughs> Sounds familiar. Uh, implemented by algorithms. And this is shaking our very democratic infrastructure. At the same time, we continue to see the growing mergers and expansion of we have big ag, uh, big food, corporations, and the growing and their growing relationships with big data and big tech corporations. On the ground, we continue to see the push for biotechnologies and chemical intensive food production system. Just yesterday, Masipag and different CSOs from the Philippines were talking about planned GMO cultivation in a GMO in a GMO free island in the Philippines and the pending approval of golden rice in the country. So it's still there, um, the discussion on um, GMOs and biotechnologies. And today we're celebrating actually the winners of the Nobel Prize for Chemistry, the women duo who developed uh, CRISPR-Cas9, permitting researchers to precisely edit specific genes or do gene editing. So this is the context where we're operating now no, in this, um, this COVID-19 um, era. So this afternoon, let's discuss how these different trends and developments are affecting Asia Pacific and what strategies are actually needed to defend food sovereignty. And can we have some level of democratic control over these new technologies? Do we even have the right to reject or um, adapt them? So um, this afternoon, let's explore these questions uh, further. Just um, to give you a background, you may be wondering why we did not make this public. You know, the, the team opted to use a Zoom webinar and deliberately did not make it public to reduce the anonymity and encourage more interaction. So we encourage you, if you have a very good Wi-Fi signal, please show your face at least once so that we could really interact and say hello. It will be really nice. Um, to get to see that you're, we're not clones, we're not all Nikki Miranda Martinez here, but different um, people from different backgrounds and different interests coming together um, to have some interaction and discussion. And for us to connect in this very crazy time when we lack real face-to-face -face social interaction. So we really designed <clears throat> the webinar as such. So we will have three speakers. We'll have Net, Tom, and Tan May. Tan Mai to kick off the conversation. And then after each presentation, we'll have some quick polls just to have some kind of interaction with each one of you. And then after all these three presentations, we'll have a quick open forum. And then we break out into smaller groups so that we could interact much more no, with each other and at least get to know a bit of each other uh, what, what we're up to these days. And then let's come back to a plenary for, for a feedback and reporting of the small groups and a last round of thoughts um, from the speakers. So with that, 
I think let's start the afternoon uh, with an introduction and overview of corporate concentration. So I pass you to Net Daniel. She's the co-executive director of ETC Group. She's based in Davao. So yeah, over to you, Net. Thanks, thanks, Dit, and thanks for that uh, very um, good um, intro that actually introduces us to what is this all about. Um, just also to um, add to what Diti said, um, this is actually an experimental mode of webinar as far as it is concerned. Because like after being zoomed in and out this past few months and really trashed and got depressed at some point by all the Zoom webinar and Zoom meetings in the past few months, we thought that uh, why don't we try um, different modes to see how we can overcome the challenges that we have experienced in Zoom webinar and online meetings, um, primarily the anonymization of those participating. So we opted for web me for um, Zoom meeting mode, so we can see everyone. Um, you can we know who is here, and we can also um, um, interact. I don't know if you call this interaction um, better, rather than not knowing who are in the crowd and also not even being able to even hear your voice. So it's it's an experiment, and we hope to um, improve this as we go through the next um, round of webinars that we're planning for the next few months. And again, thanks to Dit for um, generously sharing her time um, um, in um, moderating the the this um, discussion. And my task, um, just like. Um, Tanmai and Tom would be very, very challenging because we're only given 10 minutes um, to provide an overview. And I have 20 slides, 18 slides actually, which I will try to squeeze into 10 minutes. I will not go through them um, individually. I have um, requested Nikki, my colleague Nikki Miranda, um, to show the slide from her end because my internet connection is not so good. So Nikki, please um, show the, the slide. Um, let me start by by um, defining what do we mean by by food systems. It's like um, more and more we're using that, um, and we will be using that more <laughs> because there's going to be an upcoming UN-led uh, food system summit, and and we, um, we have all sorts of critique on that. But just to go back to the basic, what do we mean by food system? Um, that's everything: pros, um, networks. Um, and also uh, processes and infrastructure um, involved in feeding a population, feeding the world. So that's from growing, harvesting, processing, packaging, transporting, uh, marketing, consumption, and disposal. So from from A to Z um, of the food production of the of the whole uh, process and infrastructure involved in feeding the world is what we call the the global food system. And um, as far as ETC's um, analysis and um, publications are concerned, next piece, like the at least 70% of the world's people actually depend um, their food and sustenance on the peasant food web. The peasant food web is actually what feeds the world, and that's um, largely the production food production um, that comes from small-scale uh, production by shareholders, by peasants, small-scale farmers, fisher folks, urban gardeners, um, which are becoming more and more anonymized and unrecognized uh, because the attention of most policy um, processes, uh, both at the national and global level, are centered on the 30%, which is largely um, fed the, the food coming from um, industrial food chain. We have um, estimated the value of this um, in one of our publications from two years ago. Like the peasant food web, we call it the web, um, it cost about 4.5 to 5.5 um, billion dollars. And while the, the industrial food chain, um, the value is about um, 2.8, 1.8 to 2.8 billion dollars. So next please. Next week. So again, um, what comprises the peasant food web? Um, we have also broken that down into the, the contribution of rural people, um, northern peasants, urban growers, and small-scale fishers. On the other hand, the industrial farm input, input, the input side, is this much. Uh, from the 27 data that we have presented in one of our publications last year, 
um, the seeds market, the seeds um, sector is about $37 billion, and then the fertilizer um, industry is about $190 billion. This is the input market. Next, please. Um, in the past um, three years, actually from 2017, we've seen an unprecedented consolidation of the different parts of the food system, of the chain, industrial food chain. Like we've seen the most celebrated, of course, most um, mainstream in terms of getting into um, public, public consciousness because of media coverage was um, mainly the takeovers and mergers in the seeds, um, industrial seeds um, sector. So we have actually um, a seed sector that is heavily concentrated with the top three companies accounting for almost half, 49% of the global market. The top four companies that's largely buyer, integrating Monsanto. Um, that's Cortiva AgriScience, um, integrating DuPont and um, Pioneer um, Hybrid. Also, ChemChina, uh, which is now called the Syngenta Group, that includes um, Syngenta, ChemChina, and um, Adama from Israel, um, all in one, under that umbrella called Syngenta Group, that was recently acquired by, um, by Sinochem, much bigger company than ChemChina. And you actually have um, Bill Maureen and uh, BSF um, as well in that pack. About four companies own more than half. 53% of the total global market. Next, please. In the agrochemical um, sector, that's also um, highly consolidated and also closely interlinked with the seed um, sector. Like you have the key um, seed player, global players, as also the same companies that control um, the agrochemical um, sector. This is both in 2016 and 2017 and 2018, with about um, over um, two thirds, no, 70 percent, 70 percent of the global uh, market share um, is actually controlled by four, only four um, companies. Next please. I will not go deeper into that, but just to highlight that one academic. Um, from Canada actually pointed out that um, that much of the decisions to merge um, and acquire the merger and acquisition over the past two years were, were largely um, influenced by investments coming from um, asset managers. And the top asset managers in the world are actually controlling a big slice of the of the ownership of many of the of the seed, of the top seeds and agrochemical um, companies. So next, please. When we go into farm equipment, um, this is again another heavily um, consolidated, heavily concentrated um, industry, where you have about 60% um, of the no 80%, 70 70%, percent sorry, 72% of the global market um, controlled by a handful, like six companies um, globally control that fertilizer. Um, Industry next please um, has much more player, but it's it, it's the biggest of the input um, sector. Again, I will not go into the details of this because that will use up all my time. But just to give you all the highlights, um, that the same consolidation is also happening across the chain, um, namely in the animal pharma um, um, sector, where about 60% is actually controlled by only four um, companies um, that are leading in the animal pharma pharmaceutical um, sector. In the case of livestock breeding genetics, next please, Nikki. The livestock breeding and genetics, um, you have only three companies that control virtually all of the world's poultry breeding stock. Um, one of those companies is very well known in this region, Charuen Pokapan City, is one of those three companies that virtually control all of the world's poultry breeding um, stock. Next, please. And it's also uh, worth noting, next, please, um, two slides later, Nikki, um, that did, did mention um, CRISPR, that um, the Nobel Prize for Chemistry was awarded yesterday to the duos behind the discovery of CRISPR. 
and CRISPR has been quite key um, in decisions to for acquisition and merger um, in the case of, of livestock breeding um, in the past three three or four years and also a lot of the collaborative um, scientific researches and um, partnerships in R&D are all about um, sharing um, licenses um, to use CRISPR-Cas9 um, gene, gene editing technology. I will not go into that, but there are examples of that. Um, the case of CRISPR pigs um, involving Chinese um, companies and also um, um, other um, CRISPR technology applied to piggery um, in, in the U.S. Next, please. So you'll go into down the line um, into the commodity um, trading giants. Um, there are only like a handful of uh, four, actually, generally four companies that control the world's um, commodity trading, uh, which also control all of the infrastructure from silos to ports, barges, processing, and facilities. And they're also um, joining hands. Um, there were announcements, series of announcements in the last um, year coming from the big um, commodity traders, um, including Bunge, Archer, Daniel, and Midland, um, Cargill, about um, their partnerships um, that are actually anchored towards sharing data um, across the, the, um, the infrastructure and also the systems and facilities that, they, that this big four are sharing. So there are partnerships around big data, um, around the big, um, companies that are controlling commodity trading. And as one um, the economist puts it in one public in one article, they said commodity trading is an information war. And of course that's that's very very clear um, in the partnership that has emerged in recent months um, among all the commodity trading um, giants that actually involves um, sharing of big data. Next please. And um, there are also some academic studies that show that there are interconnection um, with regards to R&D, sharing of licenses, collaborative research, and all sorts of partnership among all the players across the industrial food chain, from seeds to agrochemicals to fertilizers and machineries, all the way to genetics and pharmaceutical and commodity trading. And these are just some of the examples. I will also mention some of that as, as I go on. Next, please. And all these um, huge um, milestones um, in advancing digital um, technology applications across the food system have also enabled um, not just partnership, but also sharing of technology among the key players and also adoption of digital technologies that allow the key players um, in, in the agricultural input market um, in particular um, to suck up data uh, from farms, uh, from farmers' fields, um, and using those data to provide guided information or custom-made um, advice to the farmers that are um, part of their um, customers' portfolio. Like you'll see in the slides, all of the different um, platforms used by the big um, agricultural um, giants um, that they actually sell um, to farmers, including not just part, not just their seeds, but agrochemicals, but also the technology um, to be able to provide advice to farmers and also to control um, largely the decisions of farmers on what to plant, how to plant, what to buy when and where. So this is not just limited to the um, seeds and agrochemical companies, but also include um, farm machineries and also fertilizer companies. Next, please. As we go deeply into um, looking into the recent um, collaborations of the big um, agricultural giants, um, namely Bayer, um, Syngenta, BASF, and also John Deere, um, it's fascinating to note that many of the collaborations are actually less among themselves, but also, but largely with smaller companies in the technology sector, uh, producers of drone, producers of autonomous vehicle, and also autonomous tractors. And the whole idea is about integrating um, 
agricultural chemicals, um, seeds, together with the new digital um, technologies. Like in the case of Bayer and XAG, XAG is the biggest um, agricultural drone maker in China. Um, the collaboration involves Bayer promoting XAG drones um, among its um, among its clients, and XAG in exchange will actually uh, provide um, tools for Bayer to be able to capture um, information in farmers' fields and also to integrate that. Um, in the big data that buyer controls in terms of um, preferences of farmers and, and consumers. So there's a lot of integration um, of interest, consolidation of interest between big ag and big tech recently. And many of this, um, notably many of these partnerships were announced in the past seven months while the world was actually busy um, attending to the welfare of individuals and communities in the face of the pandemic. So business went on while the world is busy with the pandemic. Um, left and right, there were announcements of partnerships, collaborative R&D in the past eight months between big ag and big tech. Next, please. Of course, um, there are, apart from the most obvious um, partnerships, there were also earlier um, examples of, of trends um, showing us about the entry of big tech um, in big food. Amazon, of course, has bought Whole Foods in 2017. There were also more subtle um, investments, like Microsoft investing in Walgreens, a pharmaceutical slash uh, food retailer um, in the north. Like Alphabet, the mother company of Google, has been investing on startups that develop technologies for health, diseases, and anti-aging. Facebook has recently um, invested in India's geo platform, uh, which is also um, involved in enabling um, e-commerce and Google, not to be outdone, also in the, um, invested in the same company. And Alibaba as well has been announcing over the past six months the increased investment over um, e-commerce companies in India, such as Big Basket, also food delivery companies like tomato and of course the germans have been investing so much in this region in food panda and it is also notable that many of the big um, tech companies including gaming companies in in china have been investing in agriculture um over the past 10 years um netease which is one of the world's biggest um Gaming company have actually opened up a base business raising pigs in 2009. So they started selling happy pigs that they grow organically and also in a humane way um, in their own pig um, raising business. They started selling that in their own uh, platform, which was later bought up by Alibaba. And it's also um, notable that uh, big tech um, companies such as Amazon, JD.com, and Alibaba are now part of the world's biggest food retailers um, globally. Next, please. So this is my last um, slide. Um, so next, please, Nikki. So just to flag up the important trends um, to challenge. Next slide. Um, definitely, we need to challenge that um, the expansion of big tech um, in the big tech's um, business interest into industrial food and agriculture sector. The slide before, Nikki, please and also um, interrogate the partnership between the big players um, and digital technology manufacturers and the implications in terms of farmers' control over data, also privacy and, all, and uh, farmers' um, right to make decisions in their farm. Also, um, big tech expansion has not just, it's not just about reaping profit, but also influencing in shaping national, regional, and global um, agenda and priorities. We've seen this in the, case, in, the, in the case of Gates and increasingly in the case of technology, uh, technology companies like um, Facebook and Amazon and Amazon and Google. And of course, um, we also have to, to follow and monitor and um, interrogate, of course, the uh, biodigital technologies that this um, integration between bio biological technologies such as um, CRISPR and digital technologies um, into um, so how they are being being applied and used as leverage for expansion of big technology um, companies in the food and agriculture sector. 
um, largely with a claim of sustainability, safety, and health. So I end my um, my presentation there. Um, that was quite long, and yeah, looking forward to um, conversation after this. Thanks, Ned. Um, please hold your questions. We'll have an open forum after um, the three presentations, so just just keep them. And do we have the poll, Mickey, um, for this session? Okay, um, yeah. Can you please answer the poll? <clears throat> what do you think? Can we as civil society and social movements stop corporate takeover of the food system? Please cast your votes. Let's see. Okay. I think everyone must have casted their vote. So that's in the poll. So 52% hmm, says maybe. And yeah, 48% says yes. So yeah, let's explore that uh, much more um, later. So thanks again, Neth, uh, for the presentation. Now let's move to the second presentation for an overview of new technologies in, um, in the food systems and hand you over to Tom. Tom from ETC Group. Over to you, Tom. Thanks very much. Hello, everybody. This is uh, Tom Wakeford, also from the ETC Group. I'm talking to you from London today. Um, and I'm going to give a very brief overview of the uh, some of the new technologies in the food system. Um, is the screen share working okay? I'm controlling my own slide. So hopefully that's okay. Yes. <clears throat> yeah, thanks. So um, when we are asked the question, um, Sorry, when we when we hear the statement, the food system is broken. Who might we normally think would be saying that? It would be the groups like in in India, the Right to Food movement, or environmental groups, maybe groups uh, trying to defend small and marginal farmers. But actually, just in the last uh, six eight months, um, immediately after the pandemic hit. Uh, what we're actually seeing is it's groups like the Rockefeller Foundation, Time to Reset the Table. It's uh, uh, high-tech startups um, backed by Silicon Valley. And it's even uh, groups promoting um, uh, petri proteins and uh, uh, high-tech solutions. So the, there's been a real shift in who's talking about the food system being broken. And the terminology that's been used is promoted by the World Economic Forum, and that is uh, the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, what is that? Well, it's got the, 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 the fourth implies there are three previous versions, and uh, this shows the very first one hundreds of years ago about mechanization, water power that replaced by steam power, mass production being the second industrial revolution, assembly lines, electricity, and then computers and automation as the third. The, the fourth one needs sort of translating into the world of food. And uh, what we talk about at ETC is uh, the, the fourth industrial revolution in the food system uh, should be divided into four broad areas of technology and there's lots of ways we could divide it this is just a, a, a useful one for today which is data which includes machine learning often called artificial intelligence uh, uh, made easier by the expansion of 5g network mobile uh, phone technology second is 
automation. So the drones, the robotics, the 3D printers we hear about in the media, sensors, remote sensing technology, and the uh, so-called Internet of Things. Thirdly, molecular. So we're all acquainted with the hype around nanotech uh, 15 odd years ago, uh, but it also includes um, synthetic biology, new genetic engineering techniques, cell culture engineering, which is how these uh, fake meats, these uh, proteins grown on the Petri dish uh, are being developed. And finally, uh, E for ecosystem, uh, these, this, these are attempts to engineer nutrient cycles, uh, water and hydrological cycles, as well as the genetic engineering of whole environments uh, through things like gene drive organisms. So you've already heard from Nest the sorts of forces that are behind uh, the, many of these changes. I'll just take for first the sort of D and the A, the data and the automation companies. So uh, along the top there, we've got uh, Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon and Microsoft, the GAFAM, and down we've got uh, BATX, which is another set known to many of you. So the top 10 companies in the world, uh, are um, eight of them are data companies, and the other two are actually providing services and data to these uh, data platform companies. How are they making their money? Well, this is very relevant to the food system, but let me tell you a little, uh, little use a little analogy first. So what happens with our Facebook accounts or our friends' Facebook accounts, if we don't have one, everybody must know somebody with Facebook or Twitter or a social networking tool, is something called social caching. So what they do, and I'm taking these images from uh, uh, The Social Dilemma, which is out on, on Netflix, uh, they take a human being's connections, what they uh, watch online, the connections they make online, what they buy in online stores, and also using the Internet of Things, anything that they buy that involves an ability to cache their data. And it is uh, gathered, um, it is used to train algorithms. So this is a picture of this uh, one human subject being used uh, all their data is being sucked up by the uh, person in the, the data platform. But then this happens thousands of um, times, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions, billions of times, until you've got a picture of somebody um, like a, uh, uh, sorry, a, a picture of, of um, a population and increasingly a picture of the world's population who are, who are online and that is used by these companies through their algorithms through the machine learning to influence their actions and uh, uh, many of you will have heard of the result of that uh, for politics um, in uh, things like the US election and the Brexit referendum elections in uh, Africa and, and Asia Pacific where companies like Cambridge Analytica have used this data to directly influence uh, uh, who's in power in these countries. So what we have in the farming system is something analogous. Uh, we have ecological caching. Because why would companies like uh, Bayer, Monsanto, ChemChina, why would they be uh, promoting all these drones? It's not just because uh, they uh, might be slightly more efficient uh, at distributing their chemicals. Uh, what the, the mission is, is to uh, get our farmers doing all this surveying, um, to gather uh, all the data, whether it be around nutrients, temperature, acidity, humidity, from all these different devices around the farm. And then it is to actually replace the physical farmers, um, particularly smallholder farmers who uh, uh, are a, a sort of new market for them, to replace them with machines and drones. So actually uh, what you have is um, the farmer's brain being replaced by corporate brawn. Uh, it's a kind of a cognitive coup in that the farmer's knowledge will all be taken up into algorithms that are, uh, have been trained in ways that benefit the corporation. 
And just to give you an idea of the scale of what's going on uh, uh, right now, um, in uh, the next few years, in the next uh, three or four years, the Internet of Things will grow to the extent that by 2025, it's expected to contain more than 100 billion connected devices. That's 127 new devices being connected per second. Now, there are lots of downsides to this. One is the amount of, uh, uh, you know, we've already talked about the sort of loss of control farmers will have, but there's also a huge energy usage to this. Uh, there's a dimension to do with the use of blockchains, which I won't get into today, which is a whole other level of energy usage. But just on current predictions, the use of energy uh, by 2025, this an estimate from a Guardian, uh, uh, a, a, some, a report in the Guardian uh, two or three years ago, is that it will be a fifth of all energy usage will be um, data clouds, Internet of Things devices. And this will also be used um, in the sort of replacing the gold rush with a drone rush. So the drones are not only um, monitoring workers, but they are mapping new lands, uh, often smallholder lands, uh, uh, things cultivated um, for particular uh, uses, subsistence usage that will then be available to corporations. They'll be mapped, the land will be grabbed, and I know there's many people on this call concerned about that. And that's a sort of data focus. I'll just turn briefly to the, uh, the M and the E of the DAME, the molecular and ecosystem approaches, because where we have a sort of data colonialism taking place uh, in the data and automation uh, areas, what we also have is a genetic colonialism joining that. So uh, at the ecosystem level, we have uh, the gene-driven farm. Uh, these, uh, this diagram shows with a, a bit of a, a North American bias, if you look at the architecture, uh, all the different uses on the farm of gene-drive organisms. Uh, so these are uh, very, what we, we have called them exterminator genes, and that they are there to eliminate populations and even um, make certain species extinct. And you may have heard of it in the context of uh, target malaria and other um, Gates funded initiatives, uh, Gates Foundation initiative to get rid of malaria. Um, now that may or may not be uh, useful. We're extremely skeptical. But what the uh, Nobel now Nobel Prize winner uh, Jennifer Doudna said in an interview, which we've quoted in in the report um, that this diagram is taken from, forcing the farm, is that she said the main application of gene drive organisms will be in agriculture. But as many researchers have said, best not to talk about that yet, best to talk about eliminating malaria. So just a final couple of slides to sort of give an overview of the, the hype of this, these new technologies is that it will make the food system more efficient, driven by data, it will be flexible, it will be people free, it will, uh, you'll, won't need to touch a living organism because this will be done by machines. Uh, it'll be intensified. Um, you'll get more productivity out of your square uh, meter of land and it'll be green. Um, there will be a sort of robo organic solution to the problem of pesticides. <clears throat> but um, when you see it all together, uh, uh, this is a, a very rough overview of all the different elements right from the seed through uh, uh, the data flowing through the uh, machinery, through the processing, through the distribution to the consumer end and even waste. Uh, what we're not seeing here um, is that, uh, that the, the fate of the humans in this will be literally uh, what's already happening with, with many digital um, scenarios, if you think of the Amazon distribution chain, um, increasingly humans are just uh, maintaining machines. They're uh, uh, working in warehouses, they're uh, um, uh, overseeing uh, certain computer operations that still need a human. Um, so uh, uh, the, all that's, rem and that's, that's for the poorer people, that's what the poorer people will be 
uh, left to do, and uh, the the rich will uh, who control these corporations will be uh, uh, living a, a life of leisure um, with lots of time to count their money. Uh, so there is one final element I just want to mention, which is uh, uh, this is all implying that land is still used for growing food. Through synthetic biology, there's another outcome. Um, uh, we, I touched on this uh, lab-grown uh, meat, uh, what we call a petri protein. Um, but that's, if you're growing things in the lab, that has consequences for the land. And what is all, all that, that is sort of uh, exists in the, uh, the plans of Silicon Valley corporations investing in these technologies. But actually, we have an example already of a company called Evolver who has done this in practice. So they uh, are developing the manufacture of saffron in the laboratory. Um, this is the Evolver uh, uh, laboratory where they're developing a synth completely synthetic alternative to saffron. And if you think of the consequences, the telecoupled effect thousands of miles away to those growing the saffron, um, it means the end of saffron cultivation and the livelihoods for, for all these farmers um, disappearing. So uh, on that rather bleak note, I will hand uh, back and look forward to uh, taking part in the discussion later on. Thanks very much. Thanks, Tom, um, for that. Okay. Um, can we have the, again, sec the second poll? Okay. So the question for all of you, will these new and emerging technologies that Tom discussed in food and agriculture be beneficial uh, for smallholder farmer, ho holders, small food producers, and peasants? What do you think? So about 52% said not at all, 33% um, says maybe, and 14% said um, yes. So thanks for uh, responding to that poll. And now um, let's hear from Tan Mai, um, a farmer from um, La Via Campesina, and how all these technologies are actually playing out in India, and particularly how it's impacting uh, smallholder farmers in India. Over to you, Tan Mai. Hi, thank you. Uh, thanks, Didi. Uh, I am Tanmay. Uh, I'm part of uh, La Via Campesina, uh, uh, which is an international present movement. And uh, also, uh, uh, it's, uh, I'm based in, uh, uh, I'm a farmer who uh, I practice agroecology in central part of India. Uh, I was I was wondering that after uh, uh, the uh, if we had to maybe repeat uh, the first poll after Tom's presentation, maybe many of the yes <laughs> might get converted into uh, maybe or no because seeing the depressing uh, situation that is happening. Uh, but yeah, we we cannot lose hope, and uh, just to. <clears throat> I would be more uh, focusing on uh, like uh, 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 some uh, experiences uh, uh, regarding this because if you see like all these things are more visible in the Western world, uh, it is more visible in the uh, global north. 
the uh, onslaught of new uh, these technologies and uh, 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 on ground results of this uh, corporate consolidation and these newer technologies and even the legislations which enable all these things uh, and uh, when when usually uh, uh, if i am to talk with a uh, lo local villager a friend uh, or uh, or even somebody in the department of agriculture with a pretty higher post uh, and tell them that uh, 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 look uh, uh, things like uh, uh, ipr on seeds are coming and uh, 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 farmers uh, might if we don't do anything farmers might have to uh, every time before sowing their own seeds they might have to take permission from certain authorities or pay some certain fees and it's like uh, they don't believe it it is like i'm uh, i'm uh, uh, doing some insane talk uh, because uh, uh, this this infiltration uh, has not directly reached to the ground uh, as much as uh, it uh, it has reached uh, in the west uh, but it but uh, uh, but uh, it has started happening indirectly and therefore it is very much uh, you can clearly see a path that uh, uh, right now in india uh, uh, the creation of the ground is happening uh, they are creating bases where uh, actually all these things uh, easier is coming uh, so uh, uh, just to show that that how this consolidation has started uh, uh, infiltrating the indian uh, uh, legal structure, the policies and the laws, uh, so that it will be easier for all these technologies and this control uh, uh, to take place in the uh, second largest uh, uh, market and the first la and the topmost accessible market in the world, uh, because China is certainly not accessible completely for uh, all these corporates. So I'll be mainly talking uh, about these main three things which have recently started making noise in India. Uh, and these are uh, especially the examples that how when these consolidations happen, how much power these companies have, uh, these corporations have over the decision making process and how they slowly, slowly creep uh, uh, in a manner uh, which, uh, which is their standard uh, uh, modus operandi uh, of telling how good this is for farmers and how to do good things. So I'll be mainly uh, focusing on these three bills recently passed by the Indian parliament. Uh, and you can clearly see the connections that uh, how uh, uh, these things uh, uh, in India early are trying to create the base for uh, making these technologies and tools uh, operational and profitable uh, in the Indian context uh, for these big corporations. Because uh, in India, uh, uh, the average farm holding is just one hectare. Uh, it's just 2.5 acres uh, per farmer and it is slowly, slowly even uh, reducing more. Uh, so uh, in order to be effective in all these technologies, you need uh, bigger land holdings and uh, uh, for people to work in. So, uh, uh, so the first one, uh, yeah, the farmers produce trade and commerce promotions and facilitation bill. So this has been introduced. These all three uh, happenings uh, have happened just last week, uh, uh, a couple of weeks back in, in the past 14 days. Uh, these have been introduced in the parliament and disc, uh, with uh, have been passed without discussions. So first bill is about uh, uh, allowing uh, liberalize, uh, uh, liberalization of the Indian markets where farmers can actually uh, have been uh, said that this, uh, what does this, this first bill, the farmers produce uh, trade and commerce promotions and facilitation bill 2020 does is allows farmers to sell their harvest outside the notified agricultural produce market committees without paying any state tax or fees. 
so it's it's a very nice summary of this act that it is actually good for the farmers because they don't have to pay any more for state taxes or fees and the new market is being set up for them then the second is about uh, the, the farmers empowerment and protection agreement on price assurance so this is basically to facilitate contract farming and now uh, farmers can make direct deals with different companies and guarantee that they get a particular price uh, even before their market is out uh, and the third is essential commodities act has been amended uh, and uh, so basically farmers can now uh, uh, sell their produce export it uh, and uh, they uh, they have now access to uh, international markets without any government uh, uh, control uh, so but in reality what is the fine text uh, so just a quick overview uh, of these three bills so the first one uh, i would like to talk about is the amendment that this government has done in the essential commodities act so for a big company like this corporate consolidation how it has affected in india uh, walmart and uh, 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 walmart has taken over uh, flipkart and amazon india has started his business opened his business in digital retail uh geo platform has uh, uh, started uh, 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 has entered through its online portal uh, geo mart and uh, uh, adani wilmar group has actually uh, the biggest uh, uh, controller of oil seeds and uh, edible oil market in india uh control of for uh, 20% of the indian oil sea, uh, edible oil market uh, which is the biggest in the world uh, in terms of consumption uh, so uh, so uh, uh, so as per this act uh, if if you are into a uh, big corporation is into the food processing business or into uh, food sec uh, trading business uh, farm produce trading business it was very difficult before uh uh three months back it was uh, very difficult for them to enter because there were certain uh, all these things if you can see uh cereals pulses potatoes onions edible oil seeds and oils were a part of this essential commodities act uh and as per this act uh because it is an essential commodity you cannot overstock it there will be price control measures that government can take uh if the prices are is too much uh they can decide when to stop imports when to allow exports so all these things were there but now in this act well, these obstacles all have been removed which were basically to safeguard uh, uh, uh producers and consumers interests but now these all these things have been removed from that list uh and uh, the, there uh, and it says that the uh uh this this limit to regulate the stocks uh, this will not apply to processors or value chain participants and as seen from the previous uh, uh, two speakers it is clear that these players are not into just one field they, if they are they are not uh, they will not be just stockists uh, they will uh, they are into processing they are into value chains and now they are even into produ producing through different forms of contract farming uh, so so basically uh, they can completely uh, uh, control the prices in the market how much farmers will get uh, 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 through uh, manipulating with the stock uh, and uh, there is exception for it for if there is a demand for export in case of exporters then uh, then also they can bypass uh, there, there will be no regulation over them over how much stock they can keep so for example adani wilmar group is a processor here and uh, is an uh, uh, have a company which uh, trades into agricultural produce and they have another subsidiary in africa then uh, they can create a false demand and still stock it uh, uh, because of these clauses that are inserted in it uh, and uh, uh then there is another the second one is about uh, uh, the uh, 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 contract farming bill which which have has been actively uh, which has been made much easier uh, for corporations to do 
and again in this farm produce contains uh, not just food items and edible stuff but also cotton uh, and fodder crops and uh, uh, and uh, uh, so there are many clauses uh, which uh, which can basically uh, uh, make uh, uh, which makes it disbalance in in uh, tilted towards the uh, side of a uh, corporate instead of a farmer because uh, uh, because there is nowhere uh, a, a guarantee uh, in the act where uh, during the contract you have to pay the basic minimum uh, price to the farmer and uh, there are too many things behind the lines which can be read through it uh, for example in section 62 uh, it is mentioned that uh, the sponsor may before accepting the delivery of any farm produce inspect the quality or any feature of such produce as specified in the farming agreement otherwise he shall be deemed to have inspected the produce and shall have no right to retract from acceptance of such a produce uh, but what it does say in fact is very important to read uh, uh, this is this is the marketing language to sell it off but what it, it actually means is uh, is uh, if uh, they uh, they they can the the sponsor or the the company can actually uh, retract from acceptance if conditions as per the agreement are not met and the conditions uh, in the farming agreement uh, can be anything there is no regulation over it how how it can be and what it cannot be uh, and uh, once you are you enter into this kind of contract farming agreement uh, uh, then uh, that produce shall not uh, expire section 7a uh, shall be exempt from the application of any state laws and state acts. So basically, all the safeguards do not apply to the uh, farmer who has entered into such a contract because now that contract, uh, that farm produce, and whatever the farming is done by that farming is now governed under this act, uh, uh, under the agreement which is between that farmer and a company. So it is pretty obvious that who will define. Uh, the rules and regulations and the fine text of the contract. It's not the farmer, obviously. It will be big corporations with fine, fine, minor details into it. And the worst part is that uh, there is no, like, they cannot even go to a civil court if something happens because they have set up a sp certain body which has to be decided by this contract. Uh, which will uh, create a, uh, uh, it will mention itself in this contract where there will be a body which will in in, term, in case of disputes that will uh, take care of the, the dispute and only if uh, the dispute is not resolved by this body they can go to a subdivisional authority uh, magistrate uh, which is very difficult for a farmer like even uh, uh, even for a farmer to go to the village head is sometimes very inaccessible and to get an appointment of an SDM who already has a lot of different responsibilities on his or her plate uh, to take up any such hearing is is quite like it's uh, it's impossible that any farmer is going to get justice uh, in such cases if something happens and the time frame which is given is sort of like it will take at least two three months even if the they get a hearing. Uh, if they get a hearing to get the results and and after the result comes nobody can appeal it you cannot go to a civil court uh, to appeal any wrongdoings uh, so uh, everything this civil courts or uh, this uh, bars basically your right to justice is hampered uh, uh, through these acts uh, and uh, this is a kind of unconstitutional if you uh, like uh, uh, go for legal opinions of many uh, experts uh, and the last one which is the most contentious one because of which thousands of farmers have started taking up to streets even in this pandemic situation uh, have been we have been raising voices the, there are uh, people who are being arrested uh, and all sorts of crazy things happening in this in this time when it is time for harvest of our first monsoon season a very busy period for farmers and yet uh, um, uh, 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 lots of us are on the streets uh, protesting and uh, it is mainly because now the government 
uh, getting assured markets, which are the uh, agriculture uh, produce marketing committees, uh, APMCs now have a problem. Uh, now they will be they, this will will bypass that whole system and is creating a new market, uh, which is basically uh, uh, going to kill this only place left in the whole Indian market where not many, just around 30% of the uh, farmers go and sell even today. Even that place uh, where uh, farmers are guaranteed a basic assurance of prices uh, that has that will be killed off slowly. So, uh, so uh, if you check just for as an as an example, the section four three of this act, uh, it says that uh, every trader who transacts with farmers shall uh, make payment for the traders uh, traders scheduled farmers produce on the same day. Or if it is not done on the same day, uh, they have to do it within three days uh, on the condition that uh, there is a delivery of the receipt. So basically, what it doesn't say is uh, if payment is done on the same day, uh, no obligation of a receipt. And this is very important. Like even in the government regulated uh, APMCs, uh, people, farmers do end up selling to traders below the minimum support price, below what has been decided by the governments as what. A basic guarantee a farmer should get, which is not legally obliging, but uh, but uh, there are many say uh, if because it is regulated there uh, many farmers if there is there are too many farmers who have sold off uh, below this uh, guaranteed price assured price by the government and they, if they produce these APMC receipts to the gov to the government government can uh, uh, roll out packages like uh, pay, give differential payments that happened in our area two years back. Uh, the it is called Bhavantar uh, Yojana, uh, uh, which locally translates to uh, uh, giving differential payments. So, so these all will be cannot be done because there will be no proof of this. Uh, so, uh, all these things. So, basically, this is just to tell that uh, how how these things and even this is like uh, no uh, same clauses as in the previous act. This has that this overrides everything else, all other judicial processes. Uh, so anyway, uh, so just to end it up, wind it up, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, this is just an example that how much powerful, because this was not uh, demanded by farmers. Uh, if this would have been demanded by farmers, then yes, we can understand. Uh, but this was not demanded by farmers, not any farmers organizations in the past 50 years, no far movement has demanded this and still how do we uh, find this rolling out and get, this has been passed very undemocratically um, no voting has happened in the lower house of the parliament uh, in the upper house of the parliament and uh, and uh, within without any discussions within a period of one week introduction and passing everything took place so th this just shows how powerful these corporates are and how this consolidation can affect the legislation forming process in your own country, in our own country. Uh, and this is very scary. Just end with pictures or uh, these are few pictures. Uh, I couldn't add to this in time. Uh, there is still hope that uh, we are working on different technologies in our farm, uh, which are not CRISPR or CAS, but uh, uh, this is uh, sesame and uh, pearl millet and indigenous cotton from our farms. These are the bees who are still uh, uh, not uh, happy because we haven't sprayed any pesticides or uh, weedicide in the farm. So we also kind of uh, do our own kind of research. Uh, for example, uh, in seed saving every year uh, in cotton, we uh, uh, and uh, pigeon pea, we let some of the seeds which have we are, uh, we are plants which uh, drop in the farm and grow uh, the next year. Uh, so ev every year, basically, if you have any crop, some seeds fall off into the ground, and they will uh, they uh, automatically uh, like um, they naturally grow whenever the rains come. Uh, so basically, uh, for our seed selection, what we do is uh, we don't buy it from the market. We don't so uh, by, because they are not climate resilient. So what we do is uh, we do our own kind of uh, GMOs uh, by doing uh, uh, climate resilient uh, uh, breeding climate, trying to breed climate resi resilient crops. Uh, 
uh, uh, in uh, for, for example what i am telling uh, that we in our regular save uh, uh, crops, uh, seeds, uh, uh, in the regular share of our seeds, which we save for next year sowing, we also add a part of these plants, which have gone, which are there in the soil throughout the, even after the uh, harvesting season, they are there in the soil for uh, almost four months, where they have to face extreme dry conditions, they have to face, uh, uh, they have to uh, survive through 48 degrees to 50 degrees of harsh sunlight and temperatures and yet they have the power to sustain themselves so uh, so we add some population of these plants uh, seeds because they are the ones who have, uh, uh, who, uh, who have survived this difficult heat that means they have uh, if we add this to the regular population of our every year seeds uh, each year our uh, seeds are getting more and more resilient so this is just one example one parameter through which we do seed selection so we are also having our own breeding and uh, uh, technological system. Yeah, uh, so uh, that's it. Uh, thank you. Uh, we can have more in the discussion. Thanks, Tanmay. That was very, very interesting um, yeah, presentation. Um, can we have the last poll? The last question. Yes. Okay. Uh, for all attendees, what do you think? Um, can smallholders, small food producers, and peasants harness um, new technologies to promote food sovereignty? What do you think? Yes, maybe, not at all. Just cast your votes. And then uh, we'll open the floor now for some questions and answers. You could also type in no, your questions on um, the chat. And uh, yeah, if you want to speak, you could also raise your hand or since I cannot see everyone, maybe ha hand in the chat box as well, or yeah, just the traffic, the conversation. Okay, ending the poll now. So, who you'll be happy, Tanmay. <laughs> uh, tan. Yes, 58%, maybe 21%, not at all, 21%. Um, so, there you go. So, thank you, um, Neth, Tom, and Tanmay uh, for that presentation. And thanks, everyone, no, for, for the poll. So, we're now opening the floor for some questions, answers, eh, questions, <laughs> and of course the answers, reflections, or any thoughts um, that you have. Ooh, it's pretty quiet. Everyone understood <laughs> or <laughs> still digesting? <laughs> Did it, are we asking people just to unmute and dive in there? Is that the plan? Yes, they could also do that. Yeah. Yeah. And just I, ask I saw I saw some people turning on their video. Maybe they're just being holding. Yeah, I back. saw Hank. I saw Hank turn his video. <laughs> Hi. Cartini Cartini's raising her hand. Okay. <laughs> so Hank and then Cartini. Thanks. Uh, Nikki, can you unmute Hank? Yeah. There you go. Hi there. Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. It's so nice to see uh, our friends from ETC Group and everybody else. Um, I'm Hank, Hank Hobling from Grain. I'm based in Barcelona. And uh, just a quick comment and a question. Um, I, um, when Tom was mentioning the... Um, the statement by a number of companies who are now uh, acknowledging or claiming that the food system is broken. I had to think of a speech done by uh, the head of uh, Danone. I think it was last year in New York at the opening of the UN Climate uh, Conference, where he basically said the same. 
uh, and he claimed like, okay, we cannot continue with the food system like this. And, um, and we really need to, uh, to become more sustainable. Uh, their framework is a lot when they talk about it, natural based solutions that he talked about. And at that meeting he launched the, I think it was business for biodiversity coalition, which uh, encompasses lots of companies who are, who are claiming to do the same. And a week later, he went to Rome and signed a deal with FAO to, um, um, to um, develop a collaboration, especially focusing on the whole issue of uh, food safety uh, linked with consumers and the whole digitalization of agriculture and the food chain. So it was prom promised and was presented as something very positive and very um, uh, as a help that companies can help us with these new digital technologies to uh, to strengthen food safety and to get more information about what's happening of these food chains which um, have become over time so much longer uh, of course we have questions with that that approach and we see it a lot as, as um, uh, pr as uh, the companies moving in we have more and more companies also claiming now including danone saying that regenerative agriculture and agroecology will become the, the, the key element of their of their farming system. So my question is, uh, we, we can all have our, our questions and, and skepticism about it. My, my question is with this whole new, you know, big data approaches where companies like, like Danone and others are collecting information from the farmer's fields. Um, again, I see potentially there are a lot of problems, but are there already any specific examples where this is happening and where it's harming farmers? Or is it something which we are, we need to be afraid of for the future? Is it just a potential danger? So I wonder whether uh, at ETC or elsewhere, uh, people have examples where this is actually happening and where it impacts farmers. Thank you. Thanks. Um, let's collect the questions first. Kartini? Nikki, can you unmute Kartini? Peace. <laughs> Thanks. Hi, everyone. Yes, thanks for this very interesting uh, presentation. Um, and it's good to hear more um, of this information sharing around on, around digital agriculture. I remember last year I was with Nat in sort of more um, the early stage, I think, when we groups start talking about digital connections with agriculture, um, though, of course, it's already taking some time. But like, for example, people are taking more atten attention to it uh, lately. And I was interesting to, to also hear in the beginning when Didit says that, um, that she just recently had these conversations around um, how digital technology helped farmers corporate, uh, corporation, no, cooperation, cooperative, <laughs> sorry, to find new markets. Um, but uh, as well as the, the last poll that says, um, can smallholder farmers um, harness the technology to uh, promote and advance uh, food sovereignty? And I was wondering, uh, listening to uh, presentations from Nat and also from Tom and, and sort of like the skepticisms in the second poll, um, I was wondering how uh, in what conditions that this, um, of course, um, the digital world are moving so fast and, and how that can be used for, for the good of the small farmers or how can, you know, to improve and advance food sovereignty. I think um, this year we, we see how farmers in India are actually um, using, utilizing social media, for example, to start marketing their produce um, and uh, setting up different ways of marketing their produce because the normal market is not just is not working. Um, so I was just wondering um, if there's any in, in what conditions that uh, situations um, can happen to advance food sovereignty in, in this digital world. Thank you. Thanks, um, Hank and Kartini. Over to you, Net To Natanmay. I will um, give it the first um, try. So thanks for um, Hank and Katini uh, for asking those those questions. These are the uh, very problematic that we need to um, put our heads together as um, civil society, particularly um, Katini's question. Like, is there any opportunity or chance for digital um, digital world to advance 
um, food sovereignty. So that's really a huge um, question that we have to put our heads um, together. Like ETC has actually, like recently we, we wrote a paper and that will be for uh, publication soon in a compendium, a compendium on digital New Deal. Uh, where we actually laid out like some, not really conditions, but um, elements that have to be there, no? Like for um, that for for even considering um, the potentials of digital technologies to advance food sovereignty, farmers' rights, etc. And among those um, elements that we have um, put forward are, of course, um, um, respecting farmers' rights um, over data and um there we don't have um any um particular or or concrete tools at the moment on how do you really assert um farmers right over data um in in a situation like this like we've we've um we have very concrete tools and evolve our um struggle around um right to seed um right to make decisions in the farm but of course, we can we can stretch that um, to apply to data, like even um, elements of access and benefit sharing, not necessarily progressive, but in, instituted um, in UN um, agreements and treaties. You can extend that to apply to to data, but that would not be appropriate. So there has to be a very thorough thinking in terms of how to um, right um, farmers' rights can be exercised with regards to data. Also. We can also um, export the element of free and prior informed consent um, in the discussion of asserting farmers' rights over data. But the how is also an issue because we're not just talking about um, individual data here. We're talking of collective um, information and in most cases anonymized um, information that are fed into algorithms. So these are actually um, um, questions no and and uh, problematic that we really have to um grapple with as a civil society we don't have an answer but we offer elements um another element that we offer of course is like putting in place a mechanism for uh, participatory and transparent assessment of technology like by assessing the technologies that are being used uh, particularly the hardware and software part of the technology you can open it up to societal debate like who owns, who controls, who benefits, not just from selling the hardware, but also um, from the extraction of data and selling the data, you know, like which is the, the model that the likes of Facebook have actually popularized and normalized. So we are actually putting forward that as an element. It's important to have that in place before we even consider um, like the, the potentials of digital technologies to advance um, the the um, key um, um, point of struggle that um, we have been um, um, promoting over the past um, decade, a civil society, a social movement. To Hank's question, um, there are actually um, examples and also um, um, experiences that have been shared in um, various fora. Like I was in a tractor um, protest in Berlin last year. Um, in January 2019, when the Global Forum for Food and Agriculture, which is the, the G20 Forum of Agriculture and Food Ministers, uh, when they discussed and adopted this resolution to advance um, uh, a digital council for agriculture and then pass it on to, to FAO um, over the course of the year and all that, there was actually a parallel um, tractor protest um, led by Via Campesina um, in Europe. Um, where actually farmers have shared experiences of how their rights are actually trampled by um, the assertion of, of, of licenses and also um, interest, corporate interest um, over um, data that are collected from farms. So there are um, um, experiences that are shared, but I doubt if there's any um, study going on right now to to put these experiences together um, and um, form a collective body of of hard um, and and um, actual experiences to argue our case. I know that Friends of the Earth in Europe, for example, is also initiating this, but largely um, collecting um, experiences. In the South, uh, most of as pointed out by by Tan Mai, uh, we there is no um, like wholesale 
um, experience where you, you were where where you can actually see the impact of all this um, um, the datafication of food and agriculture um, right now. Like China would be interesting, um, of course, because um, there's really um, an exponential growth um, in terms of adoption and deployment of agricultural drones, um, for example. Um, since since last year, when the government actually declared um, drones as agricultural machinery, again, it's one of those policies that prepare the ground um, for for um, the digitalization in food and agriculture. Like the the Central Committee of China um, last year declared that drones are agricultural machinery, and that opened up um, a, a whole new market for DJI for um, SAG to really sell. Um, um, drones of all sizes, all shapes, and all applications um, now and in partnership with Big Ag. Like Bayer, for example, in Syngenta, the partnership is not in the north. The, the target of Bayer in Syngenta are actually Southeast Asia and South Asia. That, that's primarily what the, the partnership with XAG and DJI are all about. So it would, it's really an interesting moment to put together all these experiences from the north and maybe slowly um, like document um, cases of how is this impacting uh, farmers in the south, uh, particularly in these big economies like China, India, and South Africa, as well as in Latin America, like Brazil and Argentina, where all these partnerships are actually being um, pushed hard. Thanks, Matt. Um, just mindful of the time and uh, yeah. We'll asking for an extension if it's okay with all of you um, for, for 15 minutes. I see Vince's hand. Vince? Oh, thank you, Dave. Thank you so much for, for the presenter. It was really good. And I think uh, I really learned a lot of uh, things from today's discussion. And I'm also looking forward to having a the recording of our conversation today. Just on the... On the context of uh, factory farming and its contribution to climate change, what was again the position of, of ETC on low carbon production? Uh, this could be also around decorporatization of food, right? But at the same time, I'd like to look at uh, other sources of proteins. For example, on plant-based meat or cellular-based meat, there is an increase right now in Asia as one of the mix for you know, for food security uh, among others, but at the same time, also around um, animal welfare, like for example in Singapore, and or even in, uh, mostly, uh, especially in Singapore, there's a lot of uh, government support for startups for um, alternative proteins. What was the initial frame of ETC on this? Thank you so much. Thanks, Vince. Um, any other hand or questions before I hand over to Tom or Neth? Akiko, yes. Oh? Yeah, go. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, I just have a question quick question to Tom about the gene drive. Uh, he said uh, it will be maybe applied to agriculture. And I want to know some examples or some kind of possibility what they are planning to use. Thank you. Okay, thanks um, Akiko and Vince. Um, Tom, over to you and Ned. Thanks. Uh, and uh, if, if he's still there, I can pass to, to Tanmay um, to come in as well. Um, so just to go in reverse order, uh, Akiko, your question about gene drive organisms. So already there are uh, tens of millions of dollars being invested uh, in um, uh, the use, the development of gene drive insects that would make uh, fr particularly fruit pests extinct. So this is the, the sort of very opening investments that have been made by groups like the California Cherry Board, um, other fruit producers. So you're literally wiping out um, whole species that you see as pests on your crop. Uh, now, these, these experiments are still at the laboratory stage, I should say. And at the moment, there's a global moratorium 
but I think the, uh, the this is beyond the scope of this call, but we are really hoping that the taking of everything online with UN negotiations doesn't mean that this slips through uh, because you know the, the engineering of whole ecosystems and the elimination of, of actual pollinators seems very much a, a possibility if that goes through. Um, I'll, I'll briefly answer uh, Vince uh, uh, and then let others come in with their perspective. I mean, I think the ETC's general position is that it is smallholder farmers and peasants that will uh, that, that do cool the planet, and if they're supported, they will um, cool the planet. And what we see, and the, there's a report you can find on our website about the rise of the petri protein that makes this, this point more fully, uh, is that the industry behind these industrially produced uh, proteins that are you know, made in huge industrial vats, they are going to be driving the very industrial agriculture that is high carbon emitting and destructive of the very smallholder farming that cools the planet. Um, I, I really uh, was keen to m say something brief about the this idea of using farmers using social media to find new markets because you know I think there's this um, thought that maybe there's a sweet spot between uh, uh, like abandoning all the uh, use of social media uh, and and fully embracing it and I guess it, the the comparison maybe is in the early days of Facebook where it seemed like wow I've got this thing for free I can find uh, people who I haven't talked to for a while I can share pictures of that and then 10 years later we have Facebook controlling elections <laughs> and so I think the comparison here is uh, the the power we are giving corporations to take all that data about what's being sold locally what crops and then suddenly they're influencing what inputs are being bought there's a there's a danger there of who is doing the social media and at the moment social media companies are almost universally uh, silicon valley controlled by a very small number of people um, and then finally just hank your practical e example sort of real harm that's being done now, I think this is an area where we really need good uh, investigations, good research. I mean, one hears about the influence that the Chinese um, government and Chinese corporations have on uh, places like Myanmar, and uh, I think there's a, uh, there's some talk of the um, possibility that vast areas of this, you know, largely smallholder uh, uh, farming system, peasant farming system could be being mapped right now in the sort of gray zone around the uh, uh, edges of, of Myanmar. And these uh, could be uh, being readied for exactly this sort of drone layered agriculture that, uh, that we've been touching on today. But it really needs uh, you know, proper open um, uh, uh, information to come out, which is is hard to find. But I, I defer to others who, who may know more about this. And I, I know Tan may uh, wanted to come in now. If, if that's okay, I'll I'll uh, hand over to you, Tan. Uh, yes, just to uh, add to what Tom said about uh, uh, this, uh, what Kartini was saying, using social media, and you are pointed out who who owns this social media. In India, uh, uh, this presentation is just, we can see that uh, uh, it's Facebook, it's uh, uh, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. All three social media owned by one corporate, and they have uh, uh, they have invested in uh, big stake in uh, Reliance Geo platforms, which has come into the same corporate uh, food marketing. So th these are all one thing. Like uh, currently, as you said, we can see and sell uh, a few things, uh, and it seems hopeful. But if you, uh, uh, and the other thing is when about handing over control uh, and they're controlling the elections 10 years down the line and the farm policy. But at the same time, it is also about application over uh, the large base of farmers. For example, uh, uh, if I'm producing a pigeon pea, uh, I cannot uh, 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 sell uh, 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 my uh, uh, farm produce to uh, to be able to uh, sell it to consumers. Uh, consumers will not buy it from me at one time. They will buy it throughout the year, small, small quantities, how much they can store. 
and uh, the, this this is not quite possible for an average farmer uh, if you see the current scenario uh, uh, so uh, it is it, it is uh, 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 there have to be uh, strong government uh, policy level interventions infrastructure building which enables marketplaces uh, where uh, uh, producers can participate uh, 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 on uh, equal footing as co consumers uh, uh, where consumers are not uh, corporates just corporates but uh, the actual end consumers or facilitators uh, so this is something we need to uh, uh, work on it and it is not something which is non unimaginable we have many alternatives building on many groups who are uh, 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 setting up examples uh and uh, uh, there are many processes going on around the world where we can learn and actually implement uh, at a policy level and uh, uh, as far as uh, the farmer uh, technologies is con uh, concerned uh, about uh, the last questions that these new technologies and how they are going to uh, are they going to be beneficial to farmers then uh, i think uh, uh, we have to uh, rethink how food is uh, being sold out to us, how it has been uh, brainwashed to us, that food means uh, rice, maize, and soybean. That, that, that is not true. Uh, uh, we have to think, go back to what we used to eat. Uh, even like most of uh, 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 the diet, uh, if we just concentrate only on these three things, then of course we will need GMOs, we will need gene drives. Uh, we will need drones because if 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 we have to grow only these three crops all over the world and to look at it as something feeding the whole population then yes we will need it but if we have we uh, go back re revise this whole definition of what wholesome food means uh, then th there are so many local alternatives which are readily climate resilient which are readily flood tolerant which are readily uh, salinity tolerant which are readily uh, 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 heat uh, and drought tolerance. So I think th that is where we need to shift the path. This paradigm which has been shifted, like in the case of IPRs, uh, that I I IPRs is necessary. Now we have to find an alternative to give a space for farmers uh, to uh, survive in this and their rights not to be hampered. But that is like uh, creating a paradigm where we are saying that this is the reality. We are setting up a new reality which is completely artificial, which is uh, created by the market that uh, IPR is a reality as, as real as the sun and the moon. And uh, so the, the staple being just three, four crops is a reality. So that has to be questioned and that has that, that whole paradigm has to be shifted. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Next, um, do you have anything to add? Okay. Um, any other last questions, comments, reflections? Big thoughts. Okay. If none, maybe I could ask the three speakers for your uh, maybe last thoughts, takeaway um, for the team or for the group before we end this session. Sure. I'll, I'll start. So first, I'd like to thank um, all the participants for um, staying on. And as just as we expected, this is going to be a very, very interesting and I think um, thought-provoking um, discussion because many of these questions are things that have not been asked us before. Like um, it also confronts us straight in our faces um, because as Tanmay said, there is this um, very conscious, efforts to normalize the whole discussion and the whole so-called reality of digitalization as if it's a given as if it's a, as if there's no other option but a digital world and as mentioned by tom you know the the very actors who are behind the broken food system are the ones who are preaching about the broken food system that needs to be corrected that needs to be addressed by new technologies in particular um, digital technology so these are things that we are we a civil society have to confront hard and also to challenge because like um 
the pandemic has really sidetracked um, many of us um, in our um, work in, in advancing the, the mission of the, the movement. But it has also opened up opportunities, as mentioned by, by San May. At the same time, it also um, di di distracts and also deludes you know, many of us that, oh yeah, this is going to be uh, the world that we live in where we actually can use digital technologies and all that um, to advance um, farmers' rights or even uh, farmers' um, struggles. But I think we have to, to um, stop, uh, flex. And um, what is happening and where is um, going? And I think the the reimagining um, alternatives and realities is very important at this point. Um, and we hope that we'll be able to contribute to that um, process of reimagining. And this is one that uh, is happening because we have so much time. Like. <laughs> The, those who are preaching us about how to fix the broken system in the wrong way, which makes us shake our heads or even laugh or cough, are moving fast, moving so fast that they actually manage to institutionalize the whole thing. Um, the whole um, discussion around the UN uh, Food System Summit that's coming up next year is one very important moment that we have to shape as civil society, whether from outside or those few I to engage from inside have to move um, together to address that. And in that discussion, key and core in many of the decisions, of course, is about um, digital technologies. And of course, nobody talks about it, but all, every step of the way of that digital technology involves corporate consolidation. So we need to address um, those challenges um, before us. We hope that this is just one, this is just a first step. Um, in one of the many steps that we have to take towards um, interrogating this um, reality, so-called reality that's being imposed on us. Thanks, Nat. Um, Tanmay? Oh, and Tanmay. Uh, yes. Uh, 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 I just want to uh, reiterate what uh, I began with, that uh, uh, as a closing comment, it is uh, very important that what all this corporate consolidation, new technologies, digitalization, data, uh, unregulated data, uh, and the virtual world, uh, these all uh, have established uh, itself uh, in the global north. And it is important now that we uh, we build up our networks where we uh, uh, create lots of content, where we reach out to people, not just in the South, not just producers, but also consumers, that that this is not something imaginary. This is happening and this is coming. And to explain a bit by bit that how it is happening in our places. And uh, uh, like Tom said, uh, now we are using it 10 years down the line, Facebook controls, the, uh, decides who, uh, governs us. So this has to be this this whole uh, uh, data and information and what is happening has to be converted into simplified local context and how it is uh, uh, and and actually uh, tell uh, what it is. Uh, I think it is uh, very important for all of us to uh, uh, work on. Uh, uh, so that uh, instead of welcoming all these uh, and uh, buying to this bullshit of uh, uh, of these uh, policy makers, uh, we can actually see through it and uh, question it and uh, stand uh, on the streets and oppose it. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Tanmay. Tom? Yeah, just quickly to say, I think I am optimistic in the long run because these are systems that are extremely um uh they, they are they are only able to encroach um very quickly and strip the resources out uh, uh to the extent that uh people don't realize they're doing it and i i hope through uh processes like this it the debate will um get get more widely understood and, and shared and uh, there is almost universal agreement that localized food systems are one of the things that it will come out of this 
pandemic and and you know Danone and its friends uh, uh can't exploit that as as much I just wanted to end on a, a plug for something we're just uh, beginning at ETC Group and you can contact any of us to find out more about, which is a series of conversations about exactly this dilemma about uh, which is the way forward uh, for uh, the food system. So it's called Which Way Forward. It's happening in Asia Pacific, in Africa, in Latin America, um, and beginning to happen in Europe and North America. So please get in contact with any of us if you're interested in being part of these conversations, which are happening at the grassroots, um, uh, it, it, often offline and in local languages. So uh, I'll leave you with that. Thanks. Thanks. And with that, um, thanks everyone for very fruitful um, discussion, very thought-provoking um, conversation. And this is just the start no, uh, of this conversation that we could um, continue reimagining what uh, uh, post-COVID or even the COVID-19 era should uh, look like. Much, much better. Yeah, thanks everyone. And uh, to those who are asking, yes, this um, webinar has been recorded. And yeah, the ETC group will, will send you the links if you're interested of the recording. So have a good morning, good night, <laughs> good day um, to everyone. Bye, nice to see all of you again.